Christine Chavon, and our show is Spiritual Exploration. Tonight, we're going to talk about the sitar, which is a very spiritual instrument, to, to, to my understanding. And I have here with me a very welcome guest who was a guest on my show about 10 years ago. And he got in touch with me and told me he's playing the sitar, and I said, good, let's do a show about it. His name is John Martini, and I would like to welcome him to the show tonight. Hi, Christine. Welcome, John. How you doing? Nice to see you nice again see after you. how many years, right? Ten, this is actually the 10-year anniversary. Uh, the last time we did a show together was two, 2004. Wow, amazing, you know, so. amazing. I know I would not be able to come up with that date. I wouldn't. I mean, I do remember doing shows with you, but I wouldn't be able to say when. You well, know, but the yeah. only reason why I knew is because when we got in touch with each other, I checked the dates of my tapes. Uh huh. And I oh. seen the last one we yeah, did yeah. was in 2004. I always put the dates on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So right. here we are, and, and that's how are. these things happen. That's you know, right. It, it needed to happen. That's right. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. Because the sitar is a spiritual instrument and I have never done a show about it and we are about to, I would like to start by asking you, what is the origin of the sitar? Well, the sitar evolved like everything else <coughs> on earth. Uh, it uh, really started out being the Sarasvati Veena, uh, which was played in northern India in thousands of years ago. So it was originated in India. Oh yeah, all of it. And uh, But it also had Persian influence. Uh, in middle India they had long neck lutes that they played and somewhere along the line they started evolving into the present day sitar what we have now. And there's scholarly debate whether it was the 13th century or the 18th century. And it looks it's like... It's either or, nothing in between? Well, <laughs> because of... Uh, yeah, well, it is in between. But uh, more and more scholars are being conclusive of the fact that this the sitar as we know it today is actually an 18th century instrument, which blew my mind because I always assumed that it was an ancient instrument. I thought it was about 2,000 years old when we were talking yeah, about it. Yeah, me too. You know, and what I'm learning is it's, it, they, they invented the sitar about the same time that we... Have, we invented this nation, America. Really? Uh, the 1700s. Did the guitar evolve from that too? <coughs> well, no. Yeah, I mean, well. It's a string instrument. The lutes, the long neck lutes of India worked their way, I guess, because it was a Persian influence, which was a Middle Eastern influence. So I guess they worked their way into Europe that became the lutes that were used during the Renaissance and medieval, medieval period. So, yeah, I mean, uh, no doubt. I mean, I. The longer I'm learning about Indian culture, the more I see that just practically everything that has to do with spiritual things originated from there. Sure. And then worked their way out to the rest of us. Wow. So, you know, that's the history of the sitar. And when they told me, when I, when I learned that it was more of a modern, not a modern instrument, but more of a, you know, within the last couple of hundred years, uh -huh. 300 years, 200 right. years, I, it made sense because as I'm playing it, it doesn't sound ancient, it sounds very contemporary, I mean, uh -huh. to my understanding, and that probably accounts for the fact that it became very popular in the 60s and 70s with Ravi Shankar and all that. It, it, worldwide, you m p all over the world, people were listening to the sitar, so obviously there's something about it that is very contemporary to now. And it's probably something very soothing and attractive about it. Well, that's what it is. It's, it was, it's a meditative instrument. You know, it's meditative to listen to it, and it's meditative to play it. And that's what makes it spiritual. Yeah, and because the guys that designed this and crafted it and invented it, uh, in India, they were going for that transcendental sound. See, that's why I called the show Paisley Sitar, because in our world as we know it, everything is geometric, everything is hard-edged, everything is hard and heavy, and you know, one plus one equals two, uh, word processing, you know, that kind of structure, mm -hmm. like an M.C. Escher painting, everything is interlocked and digital and technological. The sitar is like a biomorphic fluid, uh, transcendental, it's a space that you enter and it's an inter interdimensional instrument that you, know, you, you, you enter the spiritual world through your chakras by listening to it and playing it. I mean, it's designed to unlock the spiritual within you. So you're saying that even whether, whether you're playing it or listening to it, 
you can be meditating at the same time. You, yeah, it is meditation. It, 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 it brings is you meditation. into another dimension almost. It, yeah, it, 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 depending on how deep you, you want to go. I mean, uh, to me, in my, in my way of uh, understanding it, you probably can't even play the sitar unless you have some level of spiritual understanding. But listening to it, you know, is what uh, everyone can do. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, I believe it's, it's got that magical quality that it just unlocks or switches open the switches inside of you intuitively, innately, uh, and it opens up that inner space in you. All you have to do is turn off your mind, relax, and float downstream and just listen to it, you know? And I guess they have a lot of, like, albums and uh, CDs and stuff of sitar music. Yeah, now, yeah, but, uh, yeah, all over YouTube. You don't even have to buy anything. I mean, you can... I mean, it's there's there's a library of knowledge just on YouTube and Google alone, and this know. show's on YouTube. Yeah, great. And yeah. So people should, uh, and when it when it gets on YouTube, I'm gonna be posting it so that because I have sitar player friends in India. You know, I'm on Facebook and social media. Just you know, you have friends all over the world now. So. Well, yeah, I'm being watched in more than 195 countries. Hey, yeah, yeah, me too now. <laughs> <laughs> right, now you too, <laughs> yeah, is right. So that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, I have, I, I one of my, uh, I have a friend now that was actually a student of Ravi Shankar's in India. Really? And I would have never, I would have never met, you know, or got to know this guy. And I'm also, you know, friends and or acquaintances and associates with other sitar plays all over the world. I'm so sure, this is yeah. a great, this is a great second career for me. It's like, you know. And you can tell them all to you tune in now to Spiritual Exploration at YouTube yeah, and watch yeah, you yeah, doing this. Yeah. I actually have a friend of mine who works in television that, uh, you know, he, when this comes out, I'm going to be sending it to him and Good. then maybe we'll see, you know. Hey, you know, the more exposure the better, maybe right? Maybe New York City will uh, it'll be the next stop for you. <laughs> who knows, who knows, who knows. You'll be on Channel 4 or something, you know. So now you say it goes back at least hundreds of years yeah. to India, and it has evolved since its and inception. And it's still evolving, and I'm part of the evolution of it because, see, I'm not trying to mimic uh, another culture. You know, uh, that's insulting, and I wouldn't do it. And it's you know, I'm not fooling anybody. I'm not Indian. Right. You know, I'm an American. Well, we can see that. You know, I'm an American, <laughs> yes. born and raised in America, never been to India, probably never will go to India in this lifetime, not, at least not physically. It takes 24 hours to get yeah, there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to get a couple of friends of mine. In fact, one of my friends from India did come here, and we'll, I, I'll tell you about that later, but um, I forgot the train of the thought here that we were talking about. Uh, about your uh, friends in India that, that play the sitar? Uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, I lost... He came from India to, to, to see you? Well, he worked in, um, he, he was working up in Boston. I seen his work on YouTube, uh, this guy, Samip Kolkani. And I seen his work on YouTube, and I thought he was a great sitarist. He's about 33 years old, mm -hmm. and he's been playing a sitar since he's three years old. Wow, he really, really got into it. So huh? he said, yeah, you know, me and him became really good friends, and, I, and he was coming down to New York. I said, look, you know, when you come down to New York, uh, you know, I'll try to put you on TV or something. And he was coming down within a few days. There wasn't enough time. So I, uh, I booked a concert at um, Little, uh, The Taste of India on New Dorp Lane, The Taste of India 2 restaurant. And uh, the, the owner there uh, heard his stuff, really liked it, and we ended up having a concert on New Dorp Lane, which to the best of my knowledge is probably the first sitar concert proper on Staten Island, uh -huh. and I arranged for it, so I feel really proud about that. Did you get that. it written up and everything, or what? No, it was too short notice. I mean, yeah. he had a sign out in front of the window, but we did have, the, the place was full. There was a couple of hundred guests there, Wow! and it was a smash. Everybody loved it, and, uh, you know, Roman was really cool, the owner, about it, and we had a great time. He was able to get a tabla player from Queens. You plan on playing anywhere else? Uh, who, Samit? Sami? You. Um, with me, yeah. I mean, you know, well, I'm, I have a friend that's hooking me up with a couple of gigs out in New Jersey in Metuchen and, and, um, and uh, Edison. And, yeah, I'm open for business. So, <laughs> you know, if okay. anyone mm -hmm. wants to, you know. If anybody wants to sit to our player. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's why I'm, I, I want to spread this to Staten Island. I think it's a very, uh, it'll be of interest to some people. It, it always is. So what got you interested in the instrument? <coughs> 
Well, I mean, when I first heard the sitar was, I was a teenager, you know, 13, 14 years old, and I listened to the Beatles, and I listened to, you know, George Harrison was playing Norwegian Wood, and uh, on 1965, the Beatles song Norwegian Wood, and that was the first time I heard the sitar. And then he played it again on Rubber, uh, on the next album, uh, Revolver, he played Love You Too. And then on the next album, he played Within You and with Within You, Without You on Sgt. Pepper. And in- They used the sitar on all these songs. Yeah, there were several songs. And uh, then, you know, at the same time, uh, my cousin had the concert for Bangladesh album at his apartment and uh, again, I must have been 11, 12 years old, and uh, you know, I listened to it. And but one of the sides of the album was like a half hour's worth of music was Ravi Shankar and, and the band, his band, and it was like, wow, what is this? Blew you away, eh? It blew, <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it was like yogurt. You have to acquire a taste for it. Yeah, you know, so it's it's not like at first, but bit by bit by bit, like drops of water, it just kept filling up and. Finally, I got it, and I realized this is a spiritual, you know, instrument dynamo. It's yeah. it's the spiritual access to the spiritual realm innately, you know, and that's what mysticism is. It's a mystical music. Well, describe what you uh, experience when you are playing or listening. Well, when you're listening, it's real easy because all you have to do is just lay back and just let it wash over you, you know, until it starts carrying you away. And you just let it take you wherever. And it's a very- Almost like transcendental meditation. It is, it is meditation. Yeah. I mean, it is. Now, playing it is, is a different story. When I first started playing this instrument, it was so daunting, you know. I, it, it was a little overwhelming, be, you know. But now, I got it under control and I understand it's, uh, I understand its boundaries, its, it, its meaning. I understand it's, and it's a very accommodating instrument. It doesn't resist you in any way. There's some sitar purists that, you know, probably have a problem with a white guy like me playing, you know, what's, what's he doing playing, you know, on music. And I feel bad for them, but the fact is the sitar now is a global instrument and, you know, I have friends all over America, you know, American guys that are playing, you know, and, mm. and as well as Europe and Canada. So, so it's really, it's, uh, as old as it is, it's still up and coming. It's up and, it, I don't even think, because it's, it was in India all that time, like transcendental meditation. And then what happened, there was the breakout in the 60s. And somebody had to bring it, it here. Yeah, and Ravi Shankar is the guy that brought it to the West. Mm -hmm. And... He played Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. It, it, but back then, it was all the, the pop culture scene, the, the hippies, and then he played Woodstock. And he, he, didn't really, he really didn't like hippies all that much. And it probably would have died then as a fad of the time, you know? It was a, it was a pop, trippy thing at the time, you know, the psychedelic 60s. Mm -hmm. But again, George Harrison took it and screwed it in to something solidified in th into the classical aspect of it. Mm. And, you know, him and Ravi were friends till George's death, and they did a few albums together, and uh, Chance of India, uh, which was, uh, George produced it and Ravi played it, just phenomenal, phenomenal meditative in uh, album I still listen to all the time, you know? Mm -hmm. so. so let's hear you play. Oh, great, terrific. I'm gonna play, um, a raga. Yes, what is a raga while you're going to? Oh, uh, okay. Let me let me sit here and A raga is a melody form that's based on a scale. But it's um it's more than that. It's it's there's like 72 standard ragas, but there are many more. And each raga, there are ragas that are associated with the morning. Uh, there are ragas that are associated with the afternoon. There are ragas associated with the evening, with midnight. There's ragas associated with uh, the summer, the fall, the winter, the spring. In India, there's ragas associated with the rainy season. So each raga has its own character and its own mood. Is and a raga like a melody or a song? It's or a, a melody scale, 
like this is this is Rod Yaman I'm going to be playing, and it's called the King of All Ragas, and it's the first raga every sitar player learns to play, and it's the last raga that every sitar player plays in his life. So it's like an alpha and omega raga, hmm. and this is it in its purest essence. Because like I said, a raga is a scale of like five to seven notes. Oh. A raga is like a hymn. Like if you, you are, like our Latin Catholic hymns that are sung during mass time, mm -hmm. you know, um, each hymn has a specific purpose. Each raga has a specific, a specific purpose. Now, a raga is like boiling that hymn down to its purest essence. You know, like Close Encounters, you know, da, 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 you know? It's that kind of thing. It's like a cosmic logo. And it leaves each guitar player, you know, by giving so little, it allows you to embellish and to each guitar player to bring his own improvisations to, to a raga. So it's like putting your own personality you, into it. It, it puts your you put your own being into it because there's no other way to do it. So each guitar player is going to be playing it the only way that they can, which is yourself. Mm -hmm. So this is like starting out like <laughs> you know you get a little bit more embellish uh, and. <laughs>
that was amazing. Well, it was my first time playing publicly, so uh, pardon the, uh, the glitches. I, I noticed that as you got more and more into it, you really was... That's the point. It really, it, it um, <clears throat> you become one with it. And like I said, it, it allows you to be you, and it doesn't resist you. It accommodates you. And uh, that was surprising to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is the first time I played live, you know, in front of an audience, so I got a little, you know, nervous. But, you know, I mean, I this is how you, you get your chops down, you know, and, you know, and when you lose yourself in it, when you meditate and lose yourself in it, that's when you, it really takes on a life of its own. It's like you and the sitar are one. So yeah. were you playing like a, a pre-written piece or were you just going with the flow? You go with the flow. I mean, that's why I say the rag is this like melody scale. Uh, and the raga translate, the word raga translate in, in, to you, like hue, color, or in, and emotion. And so that five to seven notes, each guitar player absorbs it. And there's some standardizations over the years of certain lines, but you, s you absorb it and then you just let it out. It's like taking gospel music that we have in the West and then turning it into rhythm and blues. You know, and that's what it is. It's like you're taking this pure essence uh, church music and then you're turning into, uh, you know, your improvisations. And each guitar player brings his own spirit into it. So uh, I have a friend of mine, Samip Kolkani, the guy I told you about. Uh, he works in computers. You know, he's a computer guy. He's a techie. And uh, he, his playing is super fast and super digital. You know, yeah. and that makes sense because that's that's his that's who he is. He's a you know, and I try to I want my playing to be more like um, biomorphic. You know, more um, like from the from the nature from the ground to the spirit world naturally. You know, the energy from the earth. From the earth to the inner planes. Like I said, this music. I don't know if you grab the whole of it it like opens up certain impulses in you, you know, that uh, innate things in you and you sort of lose yourself with it. And when you're doing that, you're actually entering into the spiritual planes, you know? So, um, so then while you're playing or even listening, you go into the spiritual plane. It's almost yeah. like being in a trance of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah. I mean, because I was watching you, and and there was it looked like there'd be absolutely no talking to you. You would not. Yeah, you lose yourself completely. To the in point, the if moment. somebody's talking to you, you have no idea of it. Well, that's what meditate. Look, what this does is the same thing meditation does. It creates a space for you to get out of your routine of your mundane material existence here in the mundane world. Uh, and for a little time, it takes you into the astral planes where you are free. So it gives you a spaciousness around yourself. Well, that's what transcendental meditation is. That's what all meditation is. Right. It creates a space so that you could just get some breathing room from being identified with you know your earthly mundane existence, you know your material existence. So when you are done playing or even listening, depending, you feel higher. Yeah, you, you feel, feel yeah, you, you, yeah. you feel higher. Yeah. You feel like your your vibration has been elevated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you feel like you've been with spiritual beings? Yeah, uh, all of that. I do mean, you come back with with more of an understanding of you, anything, or if you go into it with uh, uh, with a question in mind, do you come back with an answer? Um, well, not the first time, but you will over, you will over time. Because it, when you create a, that space for yourself around you, your ego, around your mind, the mind is always chatting. If you, when you, this creates a space where then you're like on the outside, it's like you, you, you create the witness. You're, you become the witness looking in at yourself. And then you can readily see what answers, you know, need to be solved, if any, 
you know, because you're not stuck in it. You're not identified with your problems. You become the outsider looking in, and then you have better answers because you're not so emotionally invested into it. Right. So this creates that space. I mean, that's what this is designed for. I mean, and who will do it best is Ravi Shankar. You know, he'll, he, you know, he's the master at that. There's a lot of really good sitar players out there. But again, they can only bring to the table what they are spiritually. Yeah, I mean, you'll get better chops, you, you know, you can get, you know, and it's important to get better skills. You know, I've been playing a year now, you know, so this is w the result of what one year will get you, playing-wise, but meditatively and spiritually, you know, and even musically, I've been doing music since I'm 14 years old. I, I played the guitar since I'm 14. And spiritually, I've been into all that stuff now for like 27 years. So you bring to the table all of that, who you are, you know, and uh, this is just a matter of chipping away and getting your, your chops down more and more of how to express yourself with it. But who you are, the essence of who you are is going to come through this. And the master at that is, is Ravi Shankar will, will heal, if you get any of his CDs, you know, or listen to any of his stuff on YouTube, just give it some time, you know, lay down on your bed and just let it, you sink in. Uh, you'll get it after a few times. I mean, it's not going to happen immediately because it's like yogurt. This, this music's like yogurt. It takes a little time for you to acquire a taste for it. Yeah. But if you have the interest, and that's why I wanted to do this program, because there may be one or two or three people out there that, you know, a little light will go off their head and they'll say, hey, I want to learn more about this. Yeah, you know? well, that's true. I and mean, I guess you can go to any library or whatever and... Yeah, but when, you, when you're in a... Uh, yeah, yeah, any library, uh, again, uh, uh, go to the library. They have plenty of Ravi Shankar CDs at, at all the libraries. Oh, really? So have you been, like, taking any kind of lessons or did you just buy a sitar and start playing it? Uh... Well, you know, like I said, I, I played the, the, the guitar since I'm 14, and I took classical lessons with that. And I bought this sitar. It was a, a, my mother passed away 16 months ago. She was terminally ill. I took care of her and uh, towards uh, to the end. And, and during my grieving process and uh, mourning and all that, I needed something that was going to lift my spirits and get me back, you know. Into the world of the living. You know, after you go through that, you're, you're traumatized oh, emotionally, sure. psychologically. Abs absolutely. It does a number on you. With any great loss, yeah. sure. I mean, and so uh, a little light went off my head right away. It said, John, now it's time to play the sitar, you know. Mm -hmm. And I there's this music store in Greenwich Village that right on the street that I was born and raised the first nine years of my life on West 4th Street called Music Inn. And they sell, they've always sold, they've been around there like 45 years now. And I knew the guy, the owner, when I was a kid. And they sell like world instruments and exotic instruments. So I knew right away Music Inn will have what I'm looking is for. Is that where you bought that thing? I bought it, but I had it shipped to my house. Like I said, this is the year anniversary because I had it shipped to my house. It, sh it got shipped to my house uh, May f uh, March 15th of last year. And here we are taping this. March 14th. March 14th. So it's exactly 365 days from when I started playing. Wow. And That's I amazing it should fall like that. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, all these coincidences. And I didn't want to learn the sitar. I wanted to play the sitar. Yeah. You know, and learning is a drag because you got to do all the scales. And, you know, you So they do have the same kind of thing, do all the scales. And yeah. when a teacher But when teaches you reach you a certain age, like my age now, you know, you're done with age, all that stuff. <laughs> you, you also realize you have to be your own teacher in life. Sure. And so any, if you, even if you get a teacher, and, and I'm not against getting a particular, there's one teacher, a great sitarist, a female sitarist in India called Rupa uh, Panis, Paniswa. In India? Uh, yeah. But, you know, again, through, well, she's on Facebook, and, you know, she could teach me things right on, on the Internet, you know. So I'm trying to get her to, uh, because I feel her style of playing is very similar to my style. And that's what you need is to find somebody that you can relate to. But uh, I wanted to be my own teacher. Um, because at the end, the, the true guru is within. Yeah. You know, so anything I need to know, 
I mean, basically, we do know everything inside. We just don't know that we well, know. Well, you know, and the, the guru within, because God, guru, and self are one and the same, he'll guide you, she'll guide you. It, the energy will guide you to where you need to be and what you need to know. And so that's the way I've been doing it. And uh, I've been doing pretty good on my own. My Indian friends from India, they all, they all say, well, you got to get a guru. You got Because with them, you got everything. You got to get a guru <laughs> for everything, you know? But well, what is the function of a guru? Well, a guru with the sitar really is just like a music teacher. Uh huh. Okay, so Someone that's all. That. I mean, that's that's you know, guru has different meanings. You know, there's a guru can mean teacher, or guru, mentor, mentor, spiritual teacher, and then there's the guru who's the way. You know, there's the sat guru and the upa guru, and the sat guru is the way. So he, you know, it's like Jesus was a sat guru. He he, he is his being is the way. You know, so with sitar, with sitar, there's, you know, it's just, a sitar, it's, a, it's like a guitar teacher, you know, and I had that when I was young, and, you know, it's a funny thing, all my friends that, you know, when we were all teenagers, we started playing this, the guitar, they, none of them took lessons, they all learned by just playing the records and copying the records, and I'm, me, you know, I was traveling into Manhattan to Greenwich House School of Music to learn class, classical guitar music. And they were better guitarists than I ever was. So mm -hmm. I learned my lesson. Don't go to guitar teachers or sitar teachers. Teach yourself. You uh -huh. know? Do you ever take out like uh, a, a sheet of music and, and, and read it while you are? No. It, it's just sitar doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not that kind of music form. I mean, there isn't any sheet of music with the sitar. I mean, maybe when you get into like playing in an orchestral situation where you know, the star player has a certain place to come in. But by and large, it's an improvisational uh, piece of, you know, technology. You know, it's, it's designed for you to, to Im improvise on, you know. And well, the music that you find on the CDs, if you go and buy a sitar CD, uh, is that prefabricated or is that somebody just sitting there uh, well, I mean, Winging you work it. things out. I mean, like, the, the, the raga I just played, I played, you know, was it five minutes out of it? Raga, Rag Yaman is actually a raga that goes on for, like, an hour, an hour, ten minutes. It could just keep uh, going. Yeah, because there are different there are different parts to a raga. Uh, there's the, the alap, which is the slow part in the beginning. It gives you the mood. Then it goes into the, it goes into the gut, which is, like, a little bit more of an upbeat version. Then it goes into the jala. And then it goes. Sounds like a lot of work. It, it, yeah, and each section of a raga could be like twenty minutes, a half hour. I mean, these things. By the time you're done, you're probably exhausted. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and but it, it's an all. It's like again, if 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 you want to meditate, an hour and twenty minutes will really do it. But I'm on a show here, and and I'm under pressure to try to talk to you and then try to get this. Which thing. you're going to play a little bit more in a little bit. Yeah, and I'm trying to give the audience a, a real distilled, encapsulated version of of it, you know. And what you can fit into an hour. You know, you tr so I tried to give an essence of what Rag Yaman is, and you know, that's it. You know, what I mean. Does it all basically sound the same, or no. can it sound different? I mean, now you have something different you can play. Now I'm um, yeah. Well, see, again, you, there there's ragas, and then there's uh, which are more classical Hindustani Indian uh, classical pieces. Then there's what's known as a dune, which is a, a light melody. And th those are played at festivals, and they're, they're, they're more uh, light and airy and poppy. And a lot of times, sitar music is taken from, you know, the movies that they have in India, Bollywood, you know, they, you know, if there's a hit song, they'll have sitar versions of it. You know. Oh, yeah? So it's, you know, it, it runs the gamut. It's not, it's not all serious spiritual stuff. A lot of times it's just very light and... And it's not all just uh, go as you, as you go, uh, make it up as you go. No, no. Some of it is pre Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah, but they have a different way. See, in, a, in the West, we have a different structuring of our music classical music or, or even uh, pop music. It's a totally different structure. They can work with the same theme, you know, just in different ways f for an hour. 
where we have to have like a, a beginning, a middle, a bridge, you know, and then it has to all be concise within like, you know, during our pop music days where three minutes, four minutes, you know, the way we used to craft it out in the old days, and even still do t today, you know what I mean, to some degree. I mean, they, they have a different culture and a different headset, so they can play with a theme, like the same six, no six notes in repetition, like there's a great little mantra piece called Gayatri, uh, Gayatri Mantra, it's on the sitar, and it's a light piece, and it's, it's like six, seven notes that just could be repeated over and over again, you go into a trance. Mm. That's what they're about, is always trying to get to that trance, that, that, that transcendental that higher, state. Well, it's in their cooking, it's in their food, is, you know, they, it's in everything they do, they try to elevate, you know, they're in a lot older culture than we are, so they learned how to, you know, you, and, you know, they're a, a spiritual culture. We're not a spiritual culture, you know? No, and basically not. You know, so, and, but, uh, it's gone global. So, you know, this instrument's being played uh, all over the world now, I mean. Well, let's hope it catches on uh, to the point where people are becoming more spiritual and. It's going to catch on to, it's like everything else, it's to whom it may concern, you know? Mm -hmm. There's always going to be a small percentage, probably, you know, maybe no more than five, seven percent of the people, but those people then turn around who get this, who get something from it, they'll be of a higher use to other people. So it spreads out like a ripple, you know, a ripple effect. And everybody's you know. vibration keeps going up. It gets higher, yeah. yeah. And that's and there's a reason why it's gone global. And it's no small look at the look at the state of the world today. Look at the state of the planet. Look at look what's look at the going state of on. This country. Everything. 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 So this is one of the medicines that is, uh, that is being applied. And it's no coincidence that I'm here right. now on Staten Island. That's right. Spre this is part of a bigger spiritual thing that's going on. And I'm just one little, you know. So now you just played a raga, yeah. and now you have, and what was the other kind of? Uh, a dune. Dune, do you have one of those? Uh, yeah, I get, yeah, this this is a less, uh, this is not, this is not classical. Um, but actually, this was one that I was working out. Uh, it came to me, and remember I told you I was going to do, a, do a, a piece for spiritual explorations? Uh -huh. This is actually the piece, but, and it, it has a familiar sound to it, but I don't know where I heard it from.
You know, I was almost feeling like I was getting into a meditative state. That's the point. Yeah. That's what it does. That's Very it. relaxing. That's what it does. I mean, you know, if I wasn't under the gun and under pressure here with an audience and a TV audience, you know, uh, when I'm more relaxed, you know, I get a more relaxed sound. But, you know, we're under, we're under the gun. I think gun. you did just fine. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I'm coming along. I mean, Do you, you know, play every day at home? Every day. I've been playing every day. I mean, every day, at least an hour or two a day. Really? You know, because it's a lot of fun, you yeah, know? Yeah, You turn off the TV. Well, I can tell you're into it. <laughs> you turn off the TV. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I mean, I reached that, that state, you know, of intensity where it takes over. And just, just, you know, you're going for and the you just you're fly. going for the ride. Yeah, it's yeah. a magic carpet ride, you know. Yeah, you're yeah. going for the ride. I think that's where the Beatles got that magic carpet ride stuff. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, that was the that was what they were all of them at that time in the '60s. They were going for that trippy, you know, thing. But you know, that only that's a superficial aspect of it in the psychedelia era of pop music. You know, this here is more serious. And that's why I after the fad left, you know, all, the what? all of the people, you know, that were, because Donovan played the sitar, you know, uh, uh, Roger Waters from Pink Floyd played the sitar. There was a, a lot of people were uh, playing the sitar at that time. Uh, the, the Birds, uh, Roger McGuinn, you know, along with George. But George Harrison was the only one that stuck with. In fact, uh, I spoke to uh, his son Danny is a friend of mine on Facebook. And George Harrison. George Harrison's son, Danny. Mm -hmm. and, and how old would he be now? Uh, he's like in his 20s, you know, late yeah. 20s, late 20s, maybe maybe 30. Mm. And, you know, I asked him. I just came, you know, I said, look, why don't you and your mom put together an album of George's sitar work? Mm. You know, because he never stopped playing, but mm. he, he's, he didn't do it publicly. And I think there was reasons why. He didn't want to... I guess, you know, out of respect for for Robbie and other Indians that he was, you know, he didn't want to, like, you know, encroach on their, you know. It was Territory. En it was enough, you know. He, I mean, he had his own thing going, so he didn't need to, you know. Compete with that. Compete with that. And I guess, but, you know, he the work that he did do, the sitar work that he did do, he was very good on. So I got to know that there's a, there's a, a library in the house of, you know, tapes and I, I asked Danny, I said, why don't you and your mom produce, you know, put together some really nice stuff and produce an album? What did he say? Uh, he never really, uh, you know. Had any I, attention? He, he, well, he, you know, I don't know. You know, people are funny. Yeah, you, you planted the seed. I planted the seed, and who knows? You know, there may be an album coming out next year. What do I know? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Yeah. That's right. And if it is? Wonderful. That's what I wanted. If I, it is, I, you'll buy it. <laughs> yeah, well, I wanted to hear, you know, what George was up to later on in his life with the sitar, because he never stopped playing. Right. So, you know, and you can only get better at, at, with anything the longer you do it, so. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, it's true. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. And, uh, well, how many, like they say, it's, it's uh, in order to become a, an, an accomplished musician in any instrument, you need something like 24,000 hours of practice. I, you know, I, I don't know if I have that left in me. You know? <laughs> I'm not going for, you know, I'm not, you know, this is really for me, like I said, I'm not looking to compete 
Um, and You're I'm not, not looking to go professional. I, well, I mean, I'm looking to go as professional as, as John as Martini it'll take can you. go. Yeah, right. You know, yes. within the built-in, we all have built-in limitations. Sure. And that is also a thing that defines us because, you know, the, the thing that boxes you in is also the thing that molds you. So it's not only the things you can do, but it's the things you're unable to do is the thing that makes you who you are. See, I don't look at it like a competitive thing, and I don't look at it like uh, I'm looking to be a virtuoso. I'm not into that. You know, I'm into, like, having as much fun as I can have with it. You're just enjoying it. And by enjoying it, it's going to make it a, a better, a pleasant experience for me and, and hopefully for others. I mean, and you know. raise your spirit and your vibration. Yeah, I mean, that's it. I mean, whatever, it, you know, I'm 53 years old and uh, 53 going on 54, so you think I care, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm looking at the end of the line like everybody else, so it's like I'm not really, uh, you know, I'll carry this on. In the, there's actually, there's an Indian saint. Uh, he, he was a sage in the 13th century. His name was Narada Muni. And he was given a special dispensation by Lord Rama uh, to traverse the universe uh, with his transcendental sitar. So he gets to go all over the, the spiritual universe and the material universe plucking his transcendental vibrations. And I believe he's the patron saint for all of us sitar players. And I believe he's the guy that dropped it on my lap who knows? And uh, yeah, I, I, I. Now, if I you feel, believe that, and that's how you well, feel, I feel you that there's there was, there was a reason why. I'm sure. You know, even our thoughts that we have, you know, who who do, whose thought is it, you know? So, right, right. You know. Well, uh, this show was wonderful. Uh, we had a great time and uh, listening to you play. It was nice, and thank you very much for being here. And uh, good luck to you with your sitar. Thank you very much, <laughs> Christine. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, and good night.